Thank you, Jasmine, for the introduction, and it's um, lovely to be here. Uh, and I'm sorry for my delayed arrival. Um, is my um, I usually have problems with my team um, uh, when I'm connecting from my Mac. Is everything okay at your end? Can you see me and hear me okay? okay yeah, we can see me perfectly. Okay, great. So it's lovely to be here in this space. I remember coming to San Andreas years ago uh, for for another. And uh, talk, it's, you know, and it was very nice to see me to meet everyone face to face. Um, of course, during that time, um, I can't see anyone right now. Are you, am, am I still connected? Zainab, you're connected and there's lots of people listening in. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, even, even though this is virtual, it's very nice to uh, be in the same space with you all. And thanks, uh, Jasmine, for inviting me. Um, you know, to this MECAX event. Uh, as Jasmine said, this uh, we have a uh, long history going back to LSE uh, when we started doing our PhDs in the same year. Um, and um, it was a, uh, so it's a long term project basically that um, I started working on um, back in 2009. Uh, it transformed and changed um, a lot during the, uh, during the process. Um, so it came into, to, to, you know, come, came together as a book, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's difficult to cover everything about the book, and I think, but I will just try to summarize um, my main goals with writing this, this book, um, and also like some afterthoughts after after it came out, uh, and a little bit about my research. Um, so the book is about Kurdistan. It's about the concept of Kurdistan, the idea of Kurdistan. Um, and when I started uh, working on this project, my main uh, interest was understanding the relationship between uh, na nation, nation, national identity and, and the concept of territory. Uh, why um, uh, we always assume an interesting connection between these two, like do national identities have territorial identities, what's the relationship between the two, how does this change, um, in what ways this has been constructed, how it has been developed. So those were the questions that I started with. Um, and uh, my starting point was the map of Kurdistan. Um, it is a, it's a, 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 it's a, a map basically that represents the Kurdish homeland, the imagined Kurdish homeland. Um, and it uh, covers a huge, you know, uh, territory. Basically, it's uh, it ranges from uh, eastern Turkey to um, a chunk of Iran, uh, covers a bit of Iraq, even some parts of Armenia and and Syria. Uh, and you see this map in um, uh, you know nationalist programs, uh, you know on. Um, on publications, um, on the doors of the houses, um, especially the diaspora uses this concept, this map quite quite often. So that's where I um, that's where I started basically researching. When I delved into to, to the theories of nationalism, um, uh, but I'm coming from an international relations perspective, obviously, because that's my discipline, that's my home discipline. So. The project evolves into something more than just about being uh, just more than being just about maps uh, or Kurdistan per se. It turned into um, a project in which I, I tried to understand Kurdish political uh, actors, uh, and there are many of them uh, throughout the history. Uh, the Kurdish political actors' interactions with the international community or the international norm, norms of legitimacy and what gives legitimacy to um, to an entity uh, to have a statehood, to have a place in international um, platform on international platforms to um, shape the policies, influence um, the policies in the regional context or in international context. So um, so I wanted to look into their interaction uh, with the international community and in doing that, uh, how they use this territorial identity or the, the idea, the, the project of a territorial homeland um, in their interactions with the international community. So um, my work uh, has a historical sociology approach. So I looked, I tried to understand that this connection between 
the uh, Kurdish political project or projects and the international level um, over time in a long term process and try to understand the shifts and changes um, in that process, how um, um, how they changed, how the nature of their interactions change. But of course, um, when you look at a look at it from a historical sociological perspective, from a world history perspective, um, the, you end up obviously going to the transformations and changes in the international context itself, uh, the changes in the international political um, power dynamics, changes um, in the, the way the map looks, like if you look into the World War I, the process before World War I, the world looked very different, uh, at least in the European and uh, Asia, Asia Minor and Middle East regions, for instance, also in other contexts, in other geographies, and how um, norms also change over time. Um, uh, you know, what type of norms uh, are being used to legitimize, legitimize certain actions change over time. You know, today, for instance, we have um, uh, different frameworks. Um, some of them are similar to the frameworks 100 years ago, but there is a constant shift happening. So I wanted to also look into this major transformations that is happening in, in the international context over time uh, and how Kurds are situating themselves um, in relation to this transformation and change happening there. Um, so that was my main goal in this book. That's why the book starts from the late 19th century and brings us to today. Um, obviously, it's a huge history um, and I couldn't cover everything and every detail. And then I'm not a historian either. Uh, but what I try to do is to capture some um, momentous uh, periods where um, significant changes took place and, and there are which also reflected on the Kurds themselves and the way they organized, the way uh, they changed their ideology, the way changed, they shifted their goals and projects, um, including their territorial projects. And also in that process, the map of Kurdistan changed. Uh, its meaning changed, its role changed, its boundaries constantly changed as well. Uh, you know, typically they got bigger and bigger as, as the years and decades uh, went by. So um, I start with the uh, 19th century period because it's very important. The uh, last decades of the Ottoman Empire has been very significant in um, not only uh, shaping uh, the politics during the end of the empire, but also it's the historical, very important historical context where political actors of the time, both international and, uh, and in the Ottoman Empire, in that geography, pivoted themselves and changed their positions and made alliances, um, etc. Um, and also in the meantime, changed their um, uh, ideology changed their um, goals and political projects um, in the, in that process. So, therefore, I start from that process. And in the in late 19th uh, century and early 20th century, what happened in the Kurdish political context was um, these multiple Kurdish uh, tribal elite, especially, and the Kurdish intelligentsia who received education in Istanbul or in European cities um, exposed to uh, the new um, ideas around nationalism and not necessarily new, but, you know, uh, self-determination also exposed to these new um, waves that emerged in late Ottoman Empire about the future of the empire because the empire was in crisis, right? So uh, some groups were talking about more nationalistic um, goals for for the empire to transform into. Uh, there were also um, more kind of uh, groups that were emphasizing the Islamic identity and wanted to organize around Khalifa. The others were um, 
looking into you know um, moving on to uh, moving into a more kind of nation state format. So uh, in that process, Kurdish tribal elite and Kurdish organizations or uh, you know elite probably uh, or and their associations so some Kurdish uh, associations emerged during that time. They started to publish their journals. Uh, this you know 1880s and early 20th, 20th century and they all also joined into these big waves um, during the Ottoman Empire. Some of them allied themselves with the uh, Turkish nationalists um, and some of them allied themselves with the more kind of traditional uh, waves that wanted to maintain uh, the existing status quo. Um, and some of them were more kind of um, looking into the um, perhaps separatism as a as a as a Kurdish entity or uh, an autonomy, the idea of an autonomy, uh, some source of some some form of um, semi independence in in the new kind of context or within the Ottoman Empire. So um, and then obviously these changed. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, this process led us to the World War One, and I think that World War One is the is a key period in that had a huge influence in the way Kurdish nationalism evolved um, and developed. Um, so there are different explanations of what, how, how World War One affected the Kurdish nationalist uh, positioning and the po politics, and there are different explanations on that, but. Uh, the explanations differ, but you know they all agree that it was a momentous time, and that's the period when uh, Kurds, Kurdish uh, nationalist historiography claims that this was the time when the Kurds came closest to forming a Kurdistan, a state, um, with the Sev uh, Agreement uh, that uh, ended World War One, uh, but then. That agreement never came into life um, with the start of the independence war in Turkey um, and then the establishment of the Republic and then signing of the Lausanne Treaty. Um, and then that um, dream was gone basically. Uh, and in this process, even though the British were quite supportive initially, they withdrew their support and um, uh, an autonomous region was established in Iraq, um, in northern Iraq around Suleymaniyah, but that didn't uh, last very long either. And then after that, um, the um, Kurdish nationalism um, started to, uh, with the formation of new states and the division of the territories between um, Turkey, Iran, uh, Syria and Iraq. Um, over time, different Kurdish organizations emerged in four different countries. Uh, and the uh, political, cultural uh, context of each country obviously affected the way these Kurdish organizations or also emerged. These Kurdish groups, um, you know, in the in the 20th century, um, throughout the 20th century, they did interact with each other, but that interaction wasn't um, necessarily uh, led to a kind of united sense of Kurdishness or, or sorry, Kurdish, Kurdish nationalist project. So they all, um, you know, uh, set goals for themselves within each country and uh, sometimes their goals very much diverged from each other and they sometimes also end up fighting with each other. So um, this kind of idea of Kurdish community, Kurdish nation being divided nation within and throughout the history that they can't agree on a joint common goal um, around one political um, mobilization uh, that hasn't been possible. So that's one of the things that are, that are often discussed in relation to, to the Kurds. But I, you know, I, I think it's a big discussion and I'm happy to elaborate on that, but I have my own, uh, own views on that as well. So then, so the after the World War uh, one, this second big transformation I look into in the book is the um, decolonization, sorry, decolonization context um, elsewhere, which didn't have much direct impact on in on the Middle East and the groups in the Middle East, but with the um, self determination. Um, you know, becoming an international norm in the World War One context, mainly implemented by the League of Nations to the ex-Ottoman territories and Europe. Um, Kurds and Kurds did not necessarily 
you know, benefit from that process. But, but with the decolonization, with the self-determination being used again in a different context now for the formation of new states in colonized territories, gave a new hope to the Kurds. Um, so they started to push on this agenda. In the 1940s, in the 1950s, you see a flurry of activity among the Kurds going into these international platforms, presenting their maps um, and uh, situating their project within this new international normative context. That didn't go anywhere as well. Um, so again, I'm sweeping lots of history here, but you know, this is, I'm just trying to give an overview of what, 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 um, uh, you know, what, what I'm covering in the book. Um, the next period that I look into, um, so, but that kind of, actually, it's the decolonization context, you're talking about 1940s until 1990s, like, like 45, 50 years of really long period. Uh, that was definitive for the, for the curse. So in the book, I, Look a closer look into have a closer look into what happened in that historical period, um, how did the Kurdish or uh, political organization uh, or uh, changed? What you know, for instance, we see Marxist ideologies becoming quite um, dominant, you know, within those Kurdish or you know political activism. Um, increased interaction between different Kurdish factions, especially in the border areas. Uh, so cross-border connections increased in that process as well. Um, so during until I think 1970s, sorry 1940s, there were a lot of um, Kurdish rebellions against against the Turkish Republic, also rebellions in Iran and in other contexts. So the, the number of um, armed um, uh, rebellion, the number that in decreased. But then in Iraq, we started seeing a different kind of uh, process emerging with 1960s and 1950s formation of the Kurdistan uh, Democratic Party, Barzani's party, and then their organizations in, in you know, connections with Iran, the formation of the Mahabad Republic only lasted 11 months, which was the first Kurdish state that was established within the, again, uh, post-Cold War, Po, sorry, post uh, Second War, uh, Second World War period, when Iranian territories were divided into zones um, under the control of different uh, powers like Russia and and the Western powers and Iran, and in that kind of process, Kurds saw an opportunity to form a political entity that didn't last very long. Um, so, but 19 in the 1970s. Uh, the um, Kurdish political um, armed movement even further deepened these conversations with Baghdad continued, um, um, you know, quite um, radical or like quite, you know, um, violent response from, from the government as well. So in 1980s, we see the unfall um, genocide, uh, the attacks against the Kurds. Um, in Iraqi Kurdistan. So that process is um, also a period where lots of Kurds from Turkey started to run away from the you know, suppression, uh, the political pressure um, uh, to Europe and started to organize there. And then in Europe, we see this, I mean, this doesn't have, this, this didn't happen in the 1970s. They had started going uh, since the 1930s, 1940s as well. But with the 1970s, a very politically kind of active, politically aware, um, educated Kurds started to also in larger number go to Europe and organize there, uh, you know, um, working on the Kurdish language, on the alphabet, doing Kurdish publications, writings, and then all these going back to the region. So that was an interesting period for, for the Kurdish society. So therefore, I think that that 50 years period, there's a lot to cover there and it's very formative uh, for what came after, after 1990s, after the uh, collapse of the USSR and what happened afterwards, which is the third key historical moment that I focus on uh, to analyze um, how Kurds positioned themselves, what did they do, how did they shift their political uh, ideas, how did they shift their 
idea of Kurdistan, how did they promote it? And then there we see increasing references to, uh, to the human rights framework, to the concept of democracy um, and uh, applications to the European uh, course of human rights um, to um, co make complaints about the violation of their human rights by, by the Turkish state, by other states in the region. So um, the 1990s also reflected um, the um, increased uh, activism in the diaspora, even more increased activism in the diaspora among the Kurdish groups, uh, which was already ongoing, but further strengthened. And then also the 1991, um, the creation of the safe zone in Iraqi Kurdistan and the formation of a de facto Kurdish autonomous region for the first time in, in Kurdish history, uh, which became official in 2003. So, and then I look into the more kind of contemporary process, mainly from a more the diaspora perspective, uh, but also um, I finish with some um, you know, elaborations on this, um, because the Syrian war ha was happening and that had huge impacts on uh, on the ground for the Kurds. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about it as well, which was a very interesting period. And I'm writing an article right now about that period, about how the Syrian war um, and, and the regional developments shaped and transformed the Kurdish positioning again vis-a-vis -vis the international context. Uh, how did they envision their projects? Uh, what type of frameworks did they refer to to increase their leverage? Uh, what type of frameworks they, they moved away from? Um, and how did this also impact the divisions among the Kurds? Um, when we see um, the Kurds, Kurd, Kurdistan, Iraq, Kurdistan region of Iraq, um, as a Kurdish nationalist project or as a, as a project for statehood emerging in the very kind of traditional nation state format. While on the other hand, uh, which I didn't refer to at all, the formation of the PKK, for instance, goes back to the Cold War period in the 1978. It was formed in the 1980s. It started 1982, I think, started its armed conflict against the Kurd, against Turkish, against the Turkish government. Um, and then it developed and evolved in, in significant way. Now it's, it's, it's the biggest uh, Kurdish political um, armed movement in Turkey, in Syria, in Iran and, uh, and Iraq. So it, it was formed in Turkey, uh, but then it became more kind of cross-border regional organization um, and um, mobilized thousands of people um, and uh, waged a war against Turkey in the process, you know, thousands of people died on, on either side. Um, so then going back to what happened after, during and after the Syrian war is that the, the idea of a traditional nation state for the Kurds was countered by another kind of idea, another future for the Kurds, uh, which defies, which challenges the idea of nation state, it criticizes it. Initially PKK, for instance, was more uh, aiming for forming a nation state for the Kurds, another state, but then they at least officially gave up that goal and they started to seek for more autonomy within the existing boundaries. So now they have a, in, a vision of um, developed by their leader, Abdullah Hocalan, confederal and um, democratic confederalism, which um, says you know, we don't have a problem with the boundaries, but we want more kind of horizontal, bottom-up kind of democracy, um, um, which, in, you know, um, enables and facilitates cross-border, obviously, connections in a horizontal way. Um, and um, they talk about environmentalism, um, women's rights, um, um, the women in Kurd in that in the, in in that Kurdish organization formed a new ideology, a new kind of vision, the genealogy. For instance, they don't call it feminism; it's a different um, um, way of thinking. Um, so they were referring to different frameworks. So another alternative vision basically emerged in that context. So that's where I end up. And then where does this take us about the concept of Kurdistan? So the Kurdistan map continuously developed in line with this process. Some groups totally, you know, uh, more explicitly use it, especially diaspora groups explicitly use it. 
But it's uh, even though uh, no Kurdish organization says we will have, we will form a Kurdish nation state, uh, you know, that looks like that map. No one says that, but it's always in the background. It's always as a as a vision, as an idea uh, that's in the background. Um, so, um, oh, so when I'm so spanning those, this long historical period, uh, more in more theoretical terms, what I try to do is to um, look at the Kurds from a non-state perspective, because most of the work done on the Kurds still analyzes analyzes the Kurds within the bounds of the existing states and their relationship with the states. More work uh, looking at it from a more kind of IR perspective is coming up, but not many. Um, so what I wanted to do is to um, study the Kurds as, a, as an international actor um, and, and establish the, try to understand their relationship with international in a, in a more direct way rather than being through the states. Um, and talk about understand their influence on the way international context is changing and how how um, they are being affected by by this uh, by this so this kind of relational uh, theory kind of explanation. So rather than just talking about the Kurds and what happened to them, and rather than just talking about what happened in the international context, what I'm trying to understand is what goes in between. How does that kind of dialogical um, um, uh, structured kind of in between process shapes um, the outcomes. So that's what what I'm more interested in. And I think uh, having historical sociological approach and a long term uh, view uh, really helps me understand that kind of uh, gradual changes and transformations, while also you know enables me to appreciate the continuities, but also um helps me kind of try to have a balance between a very rich empirical context that is impossible to capture uh, but at the same time you know, and then but also um while looking at the empirics in a uh, in a way that doesn't prevent me from kind of seeing the long bigger processes and processual changes and uh, transformations so that's what i have um, tried to do i think i will stop there um, and I'm very happy to, you know, answer any questions if you have any. Um, I hope that gives an idea about what I'm trying to do. What I, what I have tried to do. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zainab. That was fantastic. Very rich, very impressive. How you're able to cover a lot of history in the time that you had. Um, I'm going to keep my video off because my internet just or something seemed to be a bit choppy, so it might make it easier. But hopefully, everyone can hear me. Um, I do have questions. Oh, great, thank you. I do. Have function, um, and uh, or you may also put your question in the chat box. Great. Um, so, Erwin, go ahead. If you can unmute yourself. Okay, I'm not able to. Is anyone else able to hear? I can't hear Erwin. No, okay. Um, maybe we'll just we'll wait for Erwin to maybe sort that out. And then in the meantime, if I can go to Ernest, who also has a question. Ernest, if you can unmute, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, uh, Dr. Kaya. Well, thank you for your uh, very uh, re revealing uh, lecture. Well, I have uh, well, I have uh, been uh, like um, acquiring knowledge about 
Kurdistan, Kurdistan that is quite complicated through the ages uh, of the Middle East and its history spans uh, through the history of uh, ancient Greece and Caucasus and uh, with the uh, death of the Ottoman Empire. It also had like chunks of people remaining in South Caucasus and then in part of Russia and the people being uh, deported uh, to Central Asia. Well, and I have like a bit confused what kind of vision. I mean, I mean, we you, you can meet uh, Kurdish people everywhere. It's uh, one of po probably uh, the most uh, popular ethnic groups uh, among other uh, mi uh, migrant groups in the UK, for example, or for example, in Germany. And at the same time, uh, when the self-identity uh, comes uh, to my mind, uh, there, there is like confusion. For example, this division between the languages like Sorani and Kurmanji. Uh, for example, like in Turkey and Syria, they speak Sorani. In Kurdistan is uh, Kurmanji. While in the post-Soviet countries, it's old, uh, very old uh, Ottoman period of time, uh, Sorani, and the, the people uh, barely understand each other. At the same time, uh, when there was a civil war, the Syrian civil war, that actually emerged, um, uh, like many issues emerged regarding the uh, self-identity of Kurd, uh, Kurds and how they would identify themselves, how they find in the peaceful uh, living when these all ends uh, the, the conflict in the Middle East. For example, even PKK, how they would find themselves because they are outdated and whether the, the youngsters see PKK as a perspective in the future. And uh, another thing, for example, when the representative, uh, Yazidi representative in the parliament of Iraq, she says, like, uh, I speak Kurmanji, I associate myself with Kurdish uh, since uh, we have the same roots, although we have different faiths. But at the same time, uh, it's very important, as you mentioned, that there, there must be like, uh, without a state, there must be an international representation and connection. And uh, there is also some kind of fear that that might happen a kind of uh, Kurdish Holocaust. Uh, and so, uh, of course, there are many people who are concerned about it and they are moving uh, to Europe, fearing for their fates and fates of their children. How do you see this perspective exactly? Do you mean uh, creating some kind of representation with the UN or, for example, uh, making, I don't know, the UN convention saving, uh, uh, pre preserving the ethnic minority? Is how to make, uh, I, I know it's very complicated issue, but how to make the Kurdish live? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. I, I got I got disconnected for about 45 seconds when you started talking. Um, so I, I managed to listen the last 20 seconds, uh, 40 seconds when you started talking about the Yazidis. But I didn't hear the re the previous because I my internet just suddenly um, stopped working and my I got kicked out of the teams. I'm so sorry. Well, I I can I, I can repeat that part. Okay. I mean, uh, there the, there is uh, I mean there is like a, a physical division uh, between the countries. There is I mean in Iran, in Turkey, and uh, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, but at the same time, there was also uh, parts of ethnic groups of Kurdish people living in Europe and also people uh, living in post-Soviet countries, in uh, in Russia as well, like big uh, part. And uh, some parts of them are Yazidis. Uh, and well, therefore, I mentioned Yazidi uh, parliamentarian in, in Iraq saying that we have the same root, we have the same language, but we have different faiths. Like it, it's quite normal, like in, in any other uh, multinational country. But I'm seeing that uh, in the in the in the um, in the circumstances of the Syrian civil war, uh, there are people I met, like many Kurdish people, and they're saying that we have like a very un, like shaky perspective regarding the future. Uh, and uh, how do you see uh, the preservation of uh, ethnic group? I mean, uh, the people, or how to prevent the I don't know the uh, the tragedy that, for example, Holocaust faced uh, in, in the past by by, by 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 peaceful meetings. I mean, of course, yes. but not BKK. Thanks, yeah, yes. we will let them know. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, there are a couple of things to unpack there. Um, so it's you know. I don't think I can recommend or you know envision a future for the Kurds that might be um, 
that might make their existence or political visions, you know, feasible or possible. So we are talking about millions of people and lots of different political organizations, and they have different goals. Um, and as I as 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 a researcher, I'm I wouldn't be in a position to say this is the best option for the Kurds or this is what the international community should do. Um, but I think. Um, one of the things that you know the international community should keep an eye on the human rights violations going on on there um, and understand understand the context really well um, and this is really important because what you said about the Yazidis is very interesting so almost all the Yazidis I talked to uh, said they are not Kurdish they are not they don't have the same roots um, and um, so the Yazidi, the Kurdish nation the Kurdish Kurdistan regional government, for instance, and the Kurdish nationalism emerging there has typically presented the Yazidis as part of the Kurds because they speak Kurmanchis. Um, and Yazidis are a minority group like other minority groups in, in that region, in that geography, like Assyrians, um, Chaldeans. Uh, they don't have any political uh, power. Um, their their position is not very uh, safe either, as we have seen when ISIS attacked the Ninova plains. Nobody really went there to protect them, right? So, um, so Yazidis have to basically uh, position themselves very carefully. So some Yazidis have alliances with the Baghdad government, some Yazidi tribes. Some Yazidi tribes are connected with the Kurdistan region government, some are not connected. So. There is a lot of politics, complex politics going on in the ground. So um, some Yazidis feel like they are part of Kurdistan. Uh, it's their homeland, but they don't necessarily define themselves as Kurdish. Um, so there are talks about another kind of an assimilation of the Yazidis by a Kurdish nationalism pro process might be happening as well. That's what they say. This is not what I'm saying. So it's a complex picture. And I think the international community um, should be aware of this complexity on the ground uh, and really uh, uh, focus on, on the human rights violations and, and um, what the international community usually does um, in the context of conflict is to ally themselves with the Kurds, especially guerrilla fighters, that are useful or political tribes that are useful for like that's what the mandate regime did in in the 1920s, 1980s, 1910s and 20s in Iraqi Kurdistan. And uh, more recently we saw how the US, you know, made alliances with the um, YPG forces and then abandoned them, you know, just like that. So there is a lot of um, coming and using their resources and then moving away situation going on as well uh, with the international community. Um, so uh, I think so I don't I'm not giving you a clear answer because I don't have a clear answer about what the future should like for the Kurds. And I'm not in a position to say that either it's up to them to decide what they want for their future. And they have different opinions about that. Different Kurdish groups have different opinions about that. Thank you so much. We have a couple more hands up. Um, Erwin, can I invite you to ask your question? Hopefully connection issues are better now. OK, I think that might be persisting. So Erwin, if you want to put your question in the chat, um, we can ask it out that way. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go to Aiden. Anwar, who also has his hand up. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Thank you so much for this amazing event and for providing it and the book that you've written. So I wonder, you mentioned that the Kurdish community and nation has been divided throughout history because it's been split into different parts and one part like the Red Kurdistan being in Armenia and everything. Do you think that this has impacted the current Kurdish division, like between the parts and the ideologies going on there with the different party politics and such. And do you think that this is related to the events that have gone back ever since? Thank you. Um, Adan. Shall I answer that question, Jasmine, or do you want yes, to yes. another question? Yes. Yeah, sure. Would you like? Would you like other? Would you like me to? Go to other questions. You can. Okay, great. Go ahead. I'm happy to carry on. Um, I mean, that's a really good question in terms of the historical 
uh, history obviously shapes what we see today. There is no denying that. Um, and when you look at the Turkish historical um, documents, even going back to the like 14th century, 15th century, written by Kurd themselves, they talk about this division a lot as well. Um, you know, within that political historical context, the divisions between different tribes, uh, some Kurds align themselves with the Safavid Empire, some of them align themselves with the Ottomans. Um, uh, and there is like the, this lack of, you know, unitedness um, among that comes up there as well. So that's a kind of historical narrative. Um, I mean, obviously, when we look at the history, we look at from the perspectives of today, of our conceptions of what nationhood is, what united or uh, what division means um, from today. Um, and most of the time when you read, um, you know, almost all the books, all the writings start uh, by saying, you know, Kurds are a divided society, Kurds are a divided community. Um, and, um, and it's usually presented as something that has prevented Kurds from forming their own state. Uh, and this dividedness is attributed to historically and um, historical events such as the way the um, um, imperial powers um, divided the Mesopotamia, that that territory, that territory, um, and how in that process they didn't necessarily create a space, a territorial space for the Kurds. Um, also, it's attributed to the Kurdish political actors themselves and how they uh, position themselves, ally themselves with different groups. So, for instance, when you look at the uh, documents, um, historical documents, there is a, a really well known family, Bedrhan family, um, from eastern Turkey today and from the Ottoman territory. They, they, they were a big uh, a, a, a tribal uh, Kurdish community. And uh, and they were the, they had an M rate basically, and they were a key um, uh, political actor. Um, and the Ottoman Empire is also um, administrative. They had ad administrative authority uh, in that in that process. And they uh, this family also um, was very well educated. They went to Europe. They went to Istanbul. Um, they became the leaders of the Kurdish nationalist movement and the formation of the ideology. So, and on the other hand, there are other um, families, other influential families, again, have taken high positions in the Ottoman bureaucracy, um, well educated, and they have their own territorial dominion and control. And you see this, you know, division going within them. And then when, for instance, in the late uh, Ottoman Empire period, when different political ideologies were emerging in the crisis of Ottoman Empire collapsing, so what's going to happen? Everyone, you know, there were different visions, and these two Kurdish families basically ended up in the opposite side of the of the, the situation. So, it's like, this is just one example of this idea of division going back. So, I don't disagree with that, okay? But I have a problem with how much this division is emphasized, as if every other nation is so well. You know, united. I mean, there is division in every context. I think it's maybe it's not division. Maybe it is polarity. Maybe it is uh, multiple visions existing in, in a in a in a particular community. Um, you know, there are in a in a in a no in a state. Uh, you have political parties, right? You know, I know there is a kind of state with one state that unites them, but there is still multiple groups, multiple ethnicities, religions, languages, political positions, goals, so on and so forth. So um, sometimes I think that, you know, this expectation that Kurds should have been united and if they were united, if they had managed to come together, they would have formed a state is a bit harsh because um, they were pivoting and responding to lots of very difficult economic, political, military uh, events happening around them and, and they were aligning themselves with this, with different different positions and with different groups with different international actors so it's, it was very common for for instance even within one tribal family you see members of the same family uh, having for, forging strong relations like in the uh, post world war 1 period and in that context with russia one family 
with with the with the Britain, with Britain one, with the Ottoman and our Turkish state. So even within one family, it's it's a it's a political calculation as well, which is very common in the in the Kurdish context. So in my opinion, you know, I think is this a weakness or is this a strength? Um, I don't I don't know. I mean, I don't want to comment on that because I, again. Um, it's not my place to say, well, you should be doing this or this is not this is this is the source of your weakness and etc. Uh, but one thing is that this kind of um, multiple positioning and ability to pivot and change has really given them an ability to survive uh, and navigate a very difficult history and geography. Um, and uh, and they are they are influential actors um, as the Syrian war has showed us. Uh, and somehow they they respond in different ways and and in a way that's uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but again, if I say that someone might say, well, you know, are you saying that you know they should remain divided? No, that's not what I'm saying. But um, I think we should change the narrative about this whole dividedness uh, and this emphasis on that, and instead maybe understand kind of the context in a more in a deeper way. Um, because another thing I wanted to add is, uh, for instance, in the 19th century, early 20th century, when you look at the writings of the um, travelers, European travelers, the policy documents, uh, like the, the great you know, Britain's policy documents, their engagements on the ground, um, they always talk about this division and they don't have one uh, political leader. Uh, they fight with each other, so we cannot form alliances with them. It's kind of they are so divided that they don't deserve to be a nation, but they are coming from the position of a European ideas of what nationhood is, what civilization being civilized is, what, um, you know, kind of political mechanism they want to see a development again, developmental context, that kind of colonial mentality is very much has very much pushed this idea of dividedness as well, and that, that somehow remained in, in the historiography as well. Uh, and that's how we kind of even today talk about the curse in, in that in that sense. So yeah, I, yeah, so I think again that just told. I'll stop there. A, um, that's such an important point that divisions doesn't necessarily mean that there's a flaw in a movement and sometimes can reflect the maturity of a movement. And an interesting comparison is the Zionist movement in the early 20th century, um, where there are lots of divisions, but because they were able to capture a state, a former state, that a lot of those divisions seem to be masked on the surface, but they're still there and it's actually become a strength of the relevance of the ideology internally because those debates still continue. Um, so I think that was such a salient point. Um, there's another question there as well, and Mohammed Hassan has it for you. And I'll read the question from Erwin. He said, uh, how do you relate recent Turkish efforts in Syria and Iraq to create buffer zones underpinned by securitization in the region and assimilation at, at home. And he points out that seems premised on a homogenous map of Kurdishness with the heterogeneity of Kurdish social connectedness and political order terms. And he provides an aside where he says, um, Oh, let me just find it. Uh, yeah, so he says historically there's a sort of shared sense of national identities often as a result of generally violent processes of state building and consolidation and he mentions a book titled Turning Peasants into Frenchmen for instance. There's another question from Zina Mahmoud who is commenting on I think a point that you made about the um, shared language so he said if the Kurds are the Kurds are indigenous people, right? So if the Comanji language doesn't define a group of people as Kurdish, so I think he's referring to the Yazidis here, then what are they? Um, Jasmine, your your voice is up from Nadine. I ask their question. Go ahead, Mohammed. 
I am Jasmine. I couldn't hear you for a couple of um, like twenty seconds. It okay. went and came back. Oh, and the, is it problem? Oh, yeah. Zeno Mahmoud's question is about if the Yazidis speak mm -hmm. Kumanji, does that not is that not a defining feature of mm -hmm. a nation? So if they're not Kurdish, then what are they? I got that one uh, about yeah. the um, Irvin's question. Um, you started with talking about um, in, in when you were reading the question, it's the uh, Turkish state's um, uh, activities in Syria and in Iraq. Um, but then I yeah. lost the middle. I didn't hear the middle, so I'm not sure I captured the oh, question. Right. So he just so he just mentions this. Does is the efforts in Syria in Iraq Turkish efforts in Syria and Iraq? relating to buffer zones, is that premised on an idea of a homogenous map of Kurdishness, uh, despite the heterogeneity of, of Kurdish maps? Did you catch that? Yeah, I got that. Perfect. So, Perfect. I don't, so just to clarify, I don't think the Kurdish state, you know, forget about the Kurdishness and Kurdish territory or kind of that kind of homeland. They don't. They don't think that. I don't think that's their vision. Do you mean that? You know, I don't think the Kurd Turkish state would promote the idea of a homogeneity of Kurdish uh, territory and region in that context. I just want just ask, ask, asking for clarification there. Yeah, I said this is is the idea premised on. I suppose it's a question, is it premised on a homogenous map of Kurdishness? The Tur Turkish state would, wouldn't premise anything on a homogenous <laughs> map, I think. They defy it, they don't think it exists. Um, I, maybe there is another meaning in the question that I'm failing to understand, and I'm sorry if that's the case. Um, but I'd maybe what you're, what you're yeah. referring to, Urban, is that they are kind of carrying out this um, military activity in, in both territories, which means that, you know, they might see the same problems or similar problems happening at, at their borders um, and creating a buffer zone in that area to further increase their um, uh, somehow influence um, and in those in those territories. Um, and you refer to the peasants into Frenchmen, um, like I think there are uh, wow. Some interesting points there, you know, the way, for instance, the French state's um, uh, administrative, economic, linguistic, etc., like train, railways, um, you know, in the, in the con French countryside uh, to kind of develop a sense of uh, Frenchness. Um, you know, there are some arguments that the Turkish state has this kind of civic approach as well, and that's partly true because this is going back to the kind of Ottoman state mentality as well, um, not necessarily, in, but you know, transforming into a nation state context. So Turkish state has invested um, in Southeast Turkey, in Eastern Turkey, not necessarily enough. Obviously, there are they are relatively poorer areas um, in terms of economic infrastructure, so on and so forth. But in, especially in the Southeast uh, region, uh, they have done that after the recent um, um, fighting between the PKK and the Kurdish state, sorry, Tur or PKK and the Turkish state uh, military forces um, in southeast and around the Arbukur, in and around the Arbukur in 2015. Um, after after they um, eliminated the uh, the uh, the incursion, they started to invest economically in the region, start to generate you know economic activity, so on and so forth. Um, so that might be a way of kind of had a buy-in from the Kurdish citizens uh, to kind of not to necessarily join the PKK. That's one of the economic arguments that's been made that, you know, the Kurdish citizens uh, who live in Turkey, the Turkish citizens who, I have, who are Kurdish who live in Turkey might be joining the PKK because of their economic, social, political disadvantage and the violation that they experienced in the hands of the state. And that's the push factor for them to join the PKK. Um, you know, that's that's partly through maybe like in the 1990s, some of the Turkish governments did kind of try to do that, like with, in the under leadership of uh, Özal, for instance. But the Turkish governments afterwards, um, AKP 
did that initially, but then when it didn't, it stopped serving their purposes, they totally ditched the Kurds and they have been brutal uh, against the Kurds. And as we have seen in what's happening in Syria and Iraq as well. Um, so, uh, so in the, I, at the moment, I wouldn't say the Kurdish activities in Turkish military activities in Syria and Iraq to create a buffer zone can be framed within the framework of um, uh, peasants into Frenchmen, basically that kind of state formation uh, process. I don't think this is what's happening. That's it. I don't think that's what's happening right now is that, in my opinion. Um, I think it's more about, uh, it's more of a, you know, I think military, um, geostrategic kind of mentality uh, that's led by the more nationalist factions within the Turkish government that the AKP has made alliances with um, to, you know, yeah, so there is there is a domestic, you know, political context as well going on in there. Um, about the language question, um, I mean, is, um, so if, if you come from a position of language is the one and key uh, source of national identity. So I agree with you. I see that logic in that, you know, if not all the people who are talking Kurmanchi say they are Kurdish, then what does this mean? Um, but, you know, language is um, is only one uh, component of, of national identity and uh, not everyone speaks a language becomes associated with a particular national identity, like the whole process of multiculturalism and migration of people across the world and living in different contexts has shown us that, you know, language not, is not necessarily the only source of national identity. Um, people can speak different languages, but still can feel part of a different national identity. Um, and in the case of the Yazidis, um, I think it's the geographic proximity uh, is one of the factors. So many of the Yazidis that live in Iraqi Kurdistan today has migrated there in the late World War One period from Ottoman territories. Um, and in some of the areas that they came from, uh, people didn't speak Kurdish in those areas. So um, it's a bit of, you know, living living in that locale. So they were speaking Turkish, for instance. So there are Yazidis who's very small numbers, but they have mainly migrated to Turkey and other countries around the world. Sorry, migrated to Europe and other countries who used to live in Turkey and their, their language was Turkish, for instance, but they were still feeling they were still yet they are still Yazidis. I think that's all I'm going to say on that. Thank you. Um, let me turn to if we can perhaps take a couple of questions. Um, Mohammed Hassan, would you be able to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you very much. I hope uh, so. Thank you, Dr. Zainab. I will come back to the something you tried to explain to us uh, why the Kurdish society is uh, divided. You know, you just, just what I understood that you you analyzing uh, the situation today or since 19th century. But the question is why? Maybe if you you can answer uh, over your researches and uh, you know and until uh, from 1991, the Iraqi Kurdistan they have like a semi-independent situation or statue. So and even to after 2004. They have budgets, they have money, they have, uh, it's like a uh, dependent country, you know, they deliver visa, everything. So, but, and you know, you, you, you know what's happened under referendum 2017. So the course wide divide between some of them collaborated, collaborated with uh, Baghdad and, uh, you know, this is about Iraqi Kurdistan. So why they cannot find one project. So what is the solution? And even uh, the same thing for uh, Syria as the Kurdish of Syria. So since 2011, we have even uh, with American uh, talks, maybe they will try to find a solution and unified project. But since 10 years, they cannot find any uh, 
unified project. So the question is why? This is political side. And even in uh, civil society, you know, even in Europe, we have, I'm in France, we have more than 20, 25 uh, association. So Armenians people tell me we have only two. Why you cannot only uh, have one uh, association? So this is a question, you know, I, we cannot, uh, I did a PhD about constitutional law, about federalism in Iraq. I, I, I started the history of Iraq and courts in Syria and uh, in Turkey. I didn't find uh, uh, as uh, answer or a solution. We, we cannot uh, give a solution, but why? So this is money. This is, uh, uh, you know, the um, uh, regional uh, states maybe, but even only for the objective to protect the Kurdish people, we, we saw what's happened in Afrin and uh, we saw what's happened in other area, in Karakuk, in Halabja, in everything, you know. So why Kurds cannot uh, have one project only to protect them. Uh, Thank you. Asking Thank you for a country, no independence. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm then. Um, I'm just going to because in terms of time, um, see if we can call on some of the other people have questions. So there are a couple of hands that were up and now they've gone. You still have questions? Then this opportunity. Uh, you're very welcome to. Um, Oliver does also have a question, so Oliver, go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It was really fantastic. Um, you know, just I'm you know continuing with this questions about division, etc. Um, I know it's a lot of people have said it, so sorry to jump on the bandwagon. Um, but I I just wanted to ask. Surely, um, you know, everyone's asking why there's division, uh, how it can be solved. But I, I wanted to specifically ask, um, does the uh, the fact that um, different Kurdish groups, whether they're political or or the fact that different families have aligned with different political spheres at different, uh, you know, uh, different time periods, uh, does this not put um, some sort of doubts on the strength or the um, uh, the uh, yeah, like the strength uh, of of Kurdish national identity uh, within you know Kurdish people, if they're willing to, or if certain like political groups and fam, uh, you know political um, people uh, leaders are willing to just leave that aside for short term uh, political benefits, you know, like if because obviously Kurds have really suffered. Uh, and uh, and and been under siege from you know different uh, identities, uh, whether it's like Arab in Iraq and and Syria or Turkish in in Turkey. Surely there would be a lot more uh, cross border uh, uh, solidarity and and you know uh, uh, yeah like solidarity and and nationalism would mean that people would set aside their political differences in order to really come together. You know, so does this not put in put some sort of doubts on? The, uh, the strength of this uh, nationalism, you know, or identity. Thank, Thank you, you, Oliver. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we do have a question from Rana Khalaf. Rana, go ahead. Hello, Zainab. Hi. Um, so I actually wanted to ask you a question that maybe you didn't dig into. I don't know if you're a bit in your book you dug more into, but if we focus more on the uh, Rojava, northern Syria uh, uh, area, uh, and according to that literature, it's, it, it presents itself as revolutionary. And clearly you said the question of Kurdish nationalism is at the back of everybody's mind, even though, you know, this claim for democratic confederalism. But to what extent do you consider it revolutionary? I mean, we create a state if the state is the ideal, but to what extent is this a different kind of state that's actually, you know, represents its people? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rana. Zainab, I'm going to squeeze one question in. <laughs> I have so many, but I'll give you one. Um, Lots of questions because your talk was very rich and your book is very rich. Um, you mentioned a really interesting point that the Syria conflict really 
marked a change or had a really big impact on the Kurdish movement and its goals. So could you speak a bit to why the Syria conflict has had that impact in a way that I mean, does that, um, is it greater than the impact of the Iraq invasion and the Iraq war? And how might the impact of those two conflicts have had an impact um, on Kurdish aspirations? So I think that will be the last, that's all the questions we've got time for. And so now it's over to you with the answers. Thank you, Jasmine, and everyone for the questions. They're all very difficult questions, though. It's not fair that you just <laughs> give me 12 minutes to answer all of them. Um, I'm joking, but, you know, I think uh, they're really good questions and I'm not sure I'll be able to do justice to, to them. So the first question um, about, you know, what, why, why are they divided? You know, it, yeah, it is. Um, I mean, when, when you look at other um, cross-border ethnic groups uh, in the history and in the contemporary world, there are similar um, characteristics that you can observe. So something, I think there's something to do with being at the crossroads of multiple um, empires and state regimes and um, in, 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 you know, as a region, a lot of migration routes went through there as well from the, from the early 20th, early um, early 10th century, you know, or and afterwards the Mongol invasion. So it's been a region of constant displacement, movement, uh, change, and it's always been, it's a very mountainous region as well. So no empire or um, uh, state have been actually managed to, you know, penetrate those areas as much as they would have liked, especially when you look at Safavid and Ottoman Empire, um, for 300 years they had this region between them about 100 kilometer wide border with the with the Zohab Treaty they established that and neither of them had full control in that area it was like a buffer zone so um so I, there are many explanations and I think the answer is a bit of everything uh, so I think geography and the mountainous region is one thing and and the Kurdish tribal organization this the societal tribal the structure is I think might be another factor. So we, then you have a more sociological explanation there, where uh, the tribes uh, are still quite focused on their dominion and power and territory. Like, and even though they are not tribes anymore, that kind of mentality continues. And I'm not saying tribe in a pejorative way, because tribe is a very interesting kind of um, sociological formation, political formation that you know, is very flexible and that still exists today and even in the Western world. So there is a tribal kind of, uh, I'm not saying in a very kind of indigenous pejorative way at all. Um, so, that, and, but that kind of uh, maintaining power, position, authority is a very strong element in, in Kurdish uh, political movements today. And, and you see that with the PUK and KDP in, in Kurdistan region, the, the op opportunity to form a state or a semi-state, um, you know, is really marred with this whole, this division uh, that even, that kind of makes everyone on the outside doubt that, you know, a Kurdistan state in that region, Iraqi Kurdistan region will ever form because of the internal divisions and patronage systems and so on and so forth. So um, I don't have an answer to your question, but I think these are the kind of I mean, but historically, because that's what I'm interested in long term, I think that kind of positioning between Safavid and the Ottomans and this geography uh, and being in the borderlands, um, you know, cross-border ethnic identities, I think there's something about, about that that might be explanatory. Um, so different, yeah, I think this, Oliver's question is similar, you know, a bit related to this one. So, yes, you know, when you look at the political movements and successful political movements or the formation of states um, in the in the World War One period um, in the transitioning from empires to to nation states in the Middle East, um, you know, a clear political leadership, uh, a, a strong mobilization, um, ability to garner human economic military resources around one political goal. Uh, and and struggle for it obviously has been a really important uh, you know it's, it's the main way of kind of establishing a, a nation state like that 
um, like the Kurdish, you know, the, you know, when you look at the Turkish movement, the independence movement, you, there were divisions on the ground, but you know, somehow that, you know, that's all, you know, different story. But that that kind of a, a united movement emerged. Um, and when you look at other cases as well, so there are multiple voices. So sometimes, um, so I, I get your point that, you know, that's a really important component and that's necessary and that gives strength and enables uh, the formation of a more kind of national or bigger kind of uh, project to emerge, which is lacking in the case of Kurdish, uh, uh, Kurdish nationalism and Kurdish political movement. Uh, but at the same time, I guess the, the whole divisions that we are talking about might be the reason, but also it's a very big geographic region that we are talking about. Like it's especially in this day and age, uh, is it easy to form a united kind of um, entity? P PKK has been organizing across borders and have established this kind of shared goal uh, and it has managed to mobilize people from Iran, from Iraq, from Syria, uh, from Europe, from other places. So um, compared to other national, uh, other Kurdish nationalist groups or other political movements, it has done. Um, and that, you know, when, and when you look at the characteristics of the of the PKK, it does try to move beyond um, uh, divisions. You know, there is a kind of uh, an ideology, a Marxist Leninist back in the day and still uh, Marxist ideology. They talk about bigger ideas around uh, freedom, around democracy, around um, legitimacy, which P P Iraqi Kurdistan parties also do that. But I think PKK is a bit more a much more disciplined kind of organizational um, structure as well. Um, you know, a bit authoritarian as well. So like th I think that that there is something there. But um, so yeah, I think with Rana's question, Rojova, um, how revolutionary is it? That's a really good question. You know, when uh, on on paper it looks very revolutionary, some of their activities also look very revolutionary, but they also behave quite counter-revolutionary ways as well uh, on the ground. Um, and and then the other question is, you know, are they being revolutionary until they achieve their goal? And if they, let's say, achieve their goal, will they really do a confederal uh, democracy or will they be like a state, an authoritarian state? Um, and the way it sometimes PKK treats uh, its adversaries or um, other groups can be quite authoritarian, dictatorial as well. Um, I, I couldn't generalize to you know, everyone, but you know, there are uh, elements. But at the same time, when you look at the you know, organization, political uh, mobilizations in the region. So PKK has a lot of similarities to other political entities as well in terms of the way they organize. Um, uh, but I would say compared to other political mobilizations, PKK has more revolutionary elements. So there's, um, you know, rem remnants of the, like 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, the, uh, the Palestinian movement, for instance, um, the ideologies and movements that emerged there. There is that kind of um, uh, process going on. And when you look at, you know, Turkey or when you talk with people who uh, have been in prison because they are affiliated with the PKK um, and, um, you know, they, 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 they read a lot, they think a lot, they have these ideals about the future. They, you know, there is a, like a sense of revolutionary kind of attitude, at least among its members, um, which you don't really see in other uh, Kurdish Kurdish movements, but then the Kurdish political elite um, in the in the PKK, the cadre. I don't know. I wouldn't be able to say whether they are genuinely revolutionary or not. Uh, I don't know. Um, in terms of Syria conflict, I think um, indeed the 1991, the Gulf War, the creation of the safe zone, uh, that international intervention had a huge impact on on the Kurds in Iraq, also which had you know. Uh, impact had an impact across the region as well because it kind of uh, became a hub of Kurdish activism. Universities opened there, and um, it became like a um, face dog the globe, face to the globe uh, of, of the face of the Kurds to you know to the globe, um, and it gave also hope to to the Kurds about the possibility of forming a state. So that was quite prominent, a quite 
big turn uh, uh, in turn of events and uh, quite a big massive milestone for in the Kurdish history as well. Um, so this, this Syria the Syrian war had a similar impact. Um, Partly, I think it had a different kind of impact because it didn't lead to uh, the formation of an internationally recognized de facto region, Kurdish region. If you look at the just outcomes, we have a very different outcome. Um, you know, the when you look at the conversations in 2014, 15, 16, 17, you know, there was so much hope about about the possibility of Rojava uh, forming an autonomous region, but they all, you know, went downhill. Um, it didn't happen for various reasons, in, including, um, you know, the Kurds themselves with, with the way they organized, with that they divided, etc., which is another argument that's presented to that. Um, but at the same time, I think. Um, uh, it, it, you know, we cannot underestimate the importance of um, for the not necessarily maybe Kurdish movement, but for the PKK, because PKK has been listed as a terrorist organization for organization for decades um, and Western states refrain from having any kind of relationship uh, with with PKK. Um, however, um, and then the YPG, uh, PYD, um, are connected to the PKK, right? You know, and then everyone knows this, the whole world knows this. But under the pretext of these are separate organizations, the US allied itself with PYD, YPG on the ground um, in the fight against ISIS. So this inadvertently gave um, de facto legitimacy to the PKK, even though it's a terrorist organization, um, it was seen as a possible ally uh, by the West. So I think that was a big change uh, it was a milestone for 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 the pkk as a as a movement um i think we're running out of time so i'm no, that was that was amazing thank you for the intellectual energy and in the space of 12 minutes you're able to give answers fantastic uh, everyone please give up a round of applause with symbolic emojis for zainab that was a really brilliant talk um please do read her book go and get it and cite it and share it mapping kurdistan territory self-determination and nationalism and zainab inshallah will bring you back to st andrews with the center for syrian studies and you've written that paper on syria and, and the kurds which sounds fascinating so thank you so much it's been it's always a pleasure to hear you speak and it's been wonderful to have you thank you everyone have a great evening. Thank Take care. Thank you for having me and you know, thank you to everyone for their questions and for your time. Hope to meet you in person one day.